From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. At the legislature today, the bill to fix the OPEB debt is moving quickly with action in the Senate today. Meanwhile, some House members received a briefing about the bill this morning. There's more legislation introduced this session to stop domestic violence, and advocates say they are confident the bills will pass. And education advocates say there needs to be a new approach to teaching to engage students in learning with digital media. These stories coming up tonight on The Legislature Today. And good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. For the second time this session, the state Senate suspended the constitutional rule that a bill be read on three separate days to push through in a single day. Governor Tomlin's legislation, which would eventually erase the massive debt called OPEB. OPEB stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits and has grown over the years as lawmakers in the past chose to increase future benefits instead of salaries. The $10 billion liability was cut in half by the Public Employees Insurance Agency recently. The legislature is now moving to deal with the rest of the unfunded debt. Finance Chairman Senator Roman Prezioso and Jefferson County Senator Herb Snyder say this is a historic day. Well, actually, it comes out of the personal uh, income tax line item that we've used in the past to pay off the old workers' comp debt. So there's no new tax increases. Basically, it's, it's funds that will be utilized beginning in the uh, year 2016 uh, when that workers' comp debt will be expired. Uh, uh, we'll take a portion of that, $35 million, and use that. Uh, we, we think in the next 24 years to pay off the OPEB liability. So it's no increase in taxes, no additional fees, uh, no decrease in benefits. Uh, we've, we've addressed this issue, we've looked at it for a long time, as you well know, and today finally we're going to send it to the House and the Governor for signature. This is monumental, and I, I won't speak here but just a few seconds, that but I want the general public to know that this is monumental. And I will be probably more proud to press this yay button today on this bill that we're in the forefront of dealing with this massive liability in the country, in the entire nation. We should all be proud. Every citizen in West Virginia should be proud of what we're doing today. Certainly seeking support of the bill. Question for for many years, public employees were permitted to accumulate leave time and apply it to extending medical coverage long after they retired. That policy changed in 2010. The House will get the bill tomorrow. Meanwhile, this morning, the House Committee on Pensions and Retirement was briefed about the OPEB bill. As Adam Cavalier reports, under the provisions of the bill, OPEB will be fully funded by the year 2036. Public Employees Insurance Agency Director Ted Cheatham says the bill does many things. It will generate a funding stream for the Retiree Health Care Trust of $30 million beginning in approximately 2016. That money is coming out of the personal income tax that is now used to go towards the old workers' comp fund. So when the old workers' comp fund is solvent or deemed solvent, that money, $30 million of that money will be transferred to the Retiree Health Benefit Trust. Uh, second thing it does is it creates a new trust to provide a benefit for workers hired after July 1st, 2010. Again, a funding stream comes from the same place. It's $5 million to start around the same time. Cheatham told lawmakers the bill will also remove the OPEB liability from county school boards and boards of education. That liability will come off for anything that they have under the school aid formula. So anything that's not in the school aid formula, they'll still be responsible for and still be billed for. Um, that will be also retroactive, so we'll pull all those old debts off the county boards of education. Lincoln County Democrat and Horace Mann Middle School Assistant Principal Josh Stowers says he's excited about the bill's effect on the education system. This is uh, an enormous step forward uh, for county school boards that have been carrying this OPEB liability on their books as a, as a debt, uh, and they haven't been able um, to do the things that, that, uh, that need to be done. Uh, in, in terms of maybe a salary supplement, in terms of uh, filling more teacher positions, and this will allow them to do that. So uh, this, this, is a, this is a good bill uh, on a number of different fronts, uh, and I believe it has the momentum uh, to, uh, to pass, and uh, hopefully that's the case. Berkeley County Republican Walter Duke says he does have concerns over some of the bill's details. 
the, the 30 million, 5 million split, I'm just curious as to why that split, because your, your OPEP debt should be higher for your, all your employees, and is it really one-seventh of your, your OPEP debt is going to be of employees hired after 2010? Now, we've done a lot of changes in retirement uh, code dealing with employees that have hired after 2010, which actually, to my mind, reduces the OPEP liability for newer hires. We don't have the OPEP di uh, debt um, for newer hires as great as we do for people who have already been in the system and they're 20, 30-year employees. Both Stowers and Dukes say in an ideal world, OPEB would be fully funded before 2036. But they say they're fine that it's moving down the right track. Clearly you want to pay your debts off as soon as you can. However, you don't, you don't want to put a hardship on the state budget uh, in the meantime. If you look at some of the other unfunded liabilities that we've addressed, uh, particularly in terms of the retirement plans, a lot of the retirement plans, whether it be the teacher's retirement plan, the state police retirement plan, PERS, a number of them, are amortized to be paid off around 2025, 2030. Um, and, and it was done in a way, like I said, so it doesn't hamstring the state budget, but it addresses the liability, puts us on a, puts us on a, on a plan to address the debt um, in a responsible way. I'm okay with it, but it would be nice to, have, to pay it down earlier because when you're paying it down, you're paying down you still have it hanging over your head. It's kind of like having your, your mortgage on your home. You like to pay it down earlier. The House is expected to take up the Senate's version of the bill during tomorrow's floor session. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Adam Cavalier in Charleston. The House turned down a change in its own rules today that would have required bills to have three sponsors. Kanawha County Republican Eric Nelson supported the resolution. Nelson says bills that are sponsored by one delegate can clutter the legislative process. My belief is that, you know, we're only here for 60 days, not, not a whole lot of time to do business. And, you know, it's incumbent upon us to be as efficient as we can, and I believe one way of doing that is to basically have the minimum number of sponsors on a bill at three. House Majority Leader Brent Boggs says it's crucial that all bills be considered, whether they have the support of one member or many. As a representative body and being sent here by our constituents, that's a right that we enjoy to be able to introduce legislation on their behalf. Whether, whether the other 99 of us agree or not, that is the right. Kanawha County Democrat Doug Scaff initially supported the resolution and was one of its co-sponsors. But when it came time for a vote, he opposed his own resolution after hearing Boggs' floor speech. Almost every year I've been here, this is the fourth year, we've had a piece of legislation that inadvertently has affected this whole body in a negative way because of one person's name who felt passionate about it every year not picking on any particular issue or item. But if you're ready to look those people in the eye, not just yourself, but all of us have to look those people in West Virginia in the eye that we represent and tell them that we are up here working for the people as a whole and not wasting time, even though it may appear that way on certain pieces of legislation. With the resolution's failure, House bills can have from one to 11 sponsors. A coalition of 14 victim advocacy groups has won widespread legislative support for three more laws to protect people from domestic and sexual violence. As Bob Brunner reports, all three bills are moving toward passage. A House subcommittee is finishing its work on a bill prohibiting human trafficking. Experts say nationally up to 300,000 youngsters aged 12 to 14 are being lured into prostitution and taken from state to state. West Virginia is now one of only two states without such a law. Another bill prohibiting anyone from trying to interrupt a 911 emergency call is now under consideration in the Senate. Domestic violence survivor Selena Roby, who is now her county's first female EMT firefighter, came to speak for the bill. We have an opportunity to let victims know that they can call for help. And we can make certain that offenders are held accountable if they so, so much as take that right from you. Since my years with my abuser, I've learned many things. 
I've learned to hold my head up high. I've learned that every trial and every scar makes us who we are. I've learned to trust in God, and I've learned to not give up. I will continue to stand and speak so that I can help victims obtain the one thing they want more than anything, and that is their freedom. Roby's testimony last year concerning her victimization led to passage of what's called Selena's Law, which made it a crime to unlawfully restrain a spouse or domestic partner. The third bill now moving in the Senate is co-sponsored by Senate President Jeff Kessler, and it permits a protective order to be issued to protect victims from predators who are not related or sharing living quarters. We have uh, come a long way, baby, I guess, and truthfully in what we've done over the last decade or two with domestic, domestic uh, violence laws. And so it may be a family member, it may be a brother, it may be a concerned co-worker, and that may be the person who then gets targeted by the stalker to try to, to get back at that person because they're encouraging the victim to step up and seek protection and relief. The coordinator of the West Virginia Coalition Against Domestic Violence is pleased so many lawmakers are working with so many groups on passing the three bills. We're actually celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Domestic Violence Omnibus Act that passed in 1992. So it has progressed over the years, but still women are being killed, children are being abused. We still have a problem here that we want to keep moving forward, steps at a time. In the 20 years since the passage of the legislature's first Omnibus Domestic Violence Act, there are now 14 groups working on the issues in all 55 counties. All of the 14 groups presented displays in the legislative hallways highlighting their programs. One of them featured a t-shirt with the slogan, You Can't Beat West Virginia Women. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Bob Brunner in Charleston. There aren't many proposed new laws which have the enthusiastic support of both industry and labor, but there is strong backing for an expansion of one particular law. Senate Bill 153 would give employers in construction trades a tax credit of up to $2,000 a year when employing an apprentice. Amendments. The Senate Labor Committee heard representatives of contractors and the Building and Construction Trades Union praise the pilot project, which they want expanded to provide tax breaks for the industries that take part. The program is now paid for 50-50 by labor and business. The committee unanimously passed the bill. Chairman Senator Jack Yost of Brooke County says there's no downside. This is one of those issues where everyone jumped on board. Uh, when we can help working families, when we can help labor, when we can help business uh, and reduce taxes, and we have a 100% placement uh, value on this bill. So it's a win-win situation for every entity in West Virginia. So do you think it will become law? I definitely think it will pass, yes. It will become law in West Virginia, yes. I look forward to following it through the legislature this session. Bill moves on to the Finance Committee before it's considered by the full Senate. In a moment, we'll discuss digital learning and other education issues. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 476 to extend the filing deadline for certified write-in candidates to support the required transmission of absentee ballots to voters covered by the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act. Senate Bill 477 to prohibit the possession of wild and exotic animals. West Virginia is one of only eight states that lack any restrictions for wild and exotic animals kept by private individuals. Senate Bill 478 to create an apprentice hunting license which would allow new hunters to purchase a limited number of a new class of hunting license which would permit hunting with supervision prior to obtaining a certificate of training. Senate Bill 479 to create the Spay-Neuter Assistance Fund. The bill increases commercial and pet feed registration fees for funding and Senate Bill 481 to increase the hourly rate for attorneys who are appointed to child abuse and neglect cases to $95 an hour. On second reading in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 360 to grant the purchaser of personal property at a foreclosure sale the right to dispose of personal property if the original owner has been notified. 
and Senate Bill 470 requiring the physician of a member of the teacher's retirement system to show the member is mentally or physically totally incapacitated for service and that the disability is likely to be permanent. This is consistent with current practice by the Consolidated Public Retirement Board. Today was the first ever National Digital Learning Day. It's a national awareness campaign spearheaded by the Alliance for Excellent Education, whose executive director is former West Virginia Governor Bob Wise. Joining us tonight is Senator Robert Plymel, the chair of the Senate Education Committee. He's the lead sponsor of Senate Bill 103 regarding digital learning. Also joining us is Senator Larry Edgel, also a member of that committee and a retired educator from Wetzel County. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Glad to be here. What do you have in mind here, Senator Plyma, when you talk about digital learning? What is that? Well, f first off, uh, you know, the world is, is changing. Everything is becoming digital. Part of the things that you have is uh, with the expansion of broadband in West Virginia, we felt like the next, next natural thing would be, uh, you know, c trying to get digital learning. That means uh, textbooks that are digital, uh, no longer uh, purchasing of check textbooks mm -hmm. and different things like that. So it's, it's basically looking at how kids learn today, uh, how they uh, adapt to things, and they do it electronically, they do it digitally, and, and mm -hmm. that's really the way the world is. Is it as simple as buying each kid an e-reader? Well, it could be that. It, it could be uh, being able to do things from a uh, virtual uh, standpoint in terms of uh, virtual learning where they see something in Africa, they see something somewhere else, mm -hmm. and they're getting that from a virtual standpoint. So it, it's a little bit of the digital reader. It's a little bit of everything from that standpoint. Senator Edgel, what did you teach and where? I taught New Martinsville School and Star City School and Grandview School over my career in Marshall County or in Wetzel County and uh, Mon County. And I taught middle school math all the time from fifth grade through eighth. <laughs> middle school math, fifth through eighth. How long have you been retired? Eight years. Eight years uh, the last okay. of January. Did you start seeing differences in how you were teaching math to these middle school students in those, in those years? Uh, not so much in those years. Uh, it, it, the electronic age was coming around at near the end of my career, but as I go back and substitute or go back and speak to the students in the schools, I noticed a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we had a textbook and a, you, you yeah. had 25 <laughs> problems for homework. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. No computers? We had, yeah, we had some computers. We had a computer lab in each wing of the building that I spent 25 years in. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, it was 25 computers and you took your class there, but it was basically questions and t uh, problems that came up on the screen and they solved them mm -hmm. from that. Could you see a difference in how you would teach today if you uh, had yes. digital technology? Uh, yes, it'd be completely, you, you'd have to completely retool your methods because uh, everything is built around the uh, the electronic age now, and mm -hmm. you know they they can find the answers in a hurry, and they can solve the problems in a hurry with uh, the equipment that they have now. Certainly, West Virginia made an effort to put computers in the classrooms to provide new technology to teachers. Hasn't it's not been enough? Well, I mean, personally, I, I think that it goes back to the fact that you can actually look at, uh, for, for needs, special needs students, we have an IEP. Mm -hmm. This basically can provide a digital I, IEP that, that, that the kid, the child has, mm -hmm. and that will actually carry, they can t take a portfolio with them. So they can store these things, they can see their progress and, and things like that. This is different than just having a computer. A computer, I, I mean, my children started when the Jostin Computer Learning Center came along, and as a PTO president, we purchased that for Cerrito Elementary. Mm -hmm. And I saw the kids grow from that standpoint, but it's gone beyond that. It is gone beyond that. You're both on the Finance Committee. Senator Prezioso told our reporter, Bob Brunner, that enough with technology, that kids have more technology in their back pockets than we could ever keep up with. What's your response? And he wanted a more basic three R's education. What's your response to that? Senator Angel. Well, uh, Roman and I taught at the same time in, in uh, different, actually uh, uh, our careers almost paralleled each other. Uh, but 
I can understand where he's coming from to some extent, but uh, uh, the last several years of his uh, career, he was an administrator in the uh, in a uh, school, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, you, you know you start looking around, you think somebody had you know the students have to learn their times tables and yeah. and, and it's not such an important thing in the yeah. and as yeah. it should be. And, and there seems to be frustration that students aren't learning the basic skills. Exactly. That's exactly it. And Senator Plymo and I have talked about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've spent 14 years together on the Education Committee working on uh, uh, different ways of teaching and having teachers come in and just sit and talk to mm -hmm. us. And uh, I, I think the basic skills are lacking there in mm -hmm. so many areas. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps this is why you need digital teaching tools in order to re-engage. Well, I think so. I think from a, a foundational standpoint, I agree with uh, Senator Edgell. You, you really do have to have the basics, but how do you take the basics on an individual basis? And kids learn individually more than they probably did in the past because they have the ability to do that from, from an iPhone or anything like that. What kind of timetable do you have? You have Senate Bill 103 out there. What kind of timetable do you have on this, and how much will it cost? Well, I'm not, you know, they give us a, a um, figure of $170 million from the State Department of Education, and I think that's where uh, Senator Prezioso and I do agree. I don't think it's going to take that. And the other thing that I don't think, I think that you can transform, uh, you know, the 90 million or so that you're spending on textbooks, that that can be used for digital learning for tools uh, mm -hmm. that you need. Mm -hmm. But, you know, technology is changing so fast, we're going to have to put more money into this, but it's going to have to be, a, a, you know, very smart choices that you make. Moving on to one other, a couple of other education issues while I have you here. Senate Bill 464 is at the request of the Supreme Court of Appeals and would provide that a child who is physically healthy and presumed safe is a neglected child if he or she is habitually absent from school without good cause. This is about truancy and perhaps penalties parents who neglect their children's education. Senator Edgell, your response to what the Supreme Court is trying to accomplish here? I'm hoping that w there, there can be some changes, but structurally in the families today, uh, I know of kindergartners that didn't see an adult before they left the house in the morning. They got, they uh, rose by themselves and dressed themselves and went off to school without breakfast. I, I don't know how you fix those problems. We it's it's uh, it's that that program uh, that problem is mm -hmm. growing and, and growing and it's becoming worse. And mm -hmm. my daughter teaches kindergarten in Florida. And, uh, and she says that it's just unbelievable but the, the way the kids come to school today and parents don't even check on them. I don't know how you do it. That's so sad. And that's in Florida. We're not the only yeah. one with this problem. No. Yeah. And, I, and, and really, if you look at it, uh, truancy, we've been asking the, the Supreme Court and, and our judges in our circuits mm -hmm. to really address this, and they really took it on. I have to applaud what they've done, and particularly Justice Davis in, as the Chief Justice. She took this on and said, we're going to do it, and what a really startling fact that this is. Mm -hmm. When we have the, the kids that we have in truancy, 80 percent of them end up not just before the judges in jail yeah. and it, we've got to correct that problem it's going to have to take us all and you know I applaud the Supreme Court for uh, advocating on this. Senator Robert Plymel and Senator Larry Edgell glad to have you here thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 4373, to discourage employers from closing call centers and customer service operations in the state and relocating overseas. The penalty is $10,000 a day for each day of a violation. House Bill 4374, to limit a landowner from civil liability for injuries that may occur while hunting on the property. House Bill 4376, to permit wine sales at professional baseball stadiums. House Bill 4377 to create Nitro's Law to honor fallen law enforcement canines and other canines in service of state and local government agencies and to honor their handlers. 
The bill requires a picture of the canine and its most recent handler be placed on a wall of honor at the law enforcement agency and an obituary posted in the local newspaper in honor of the fallen canine. The bill is named after a dog that starved to death at a canine training facility in Ohio. House Bill 4387, to require voters to provide a photo ID when voting, to provide for provisional ballots to be cast by voters who do not possess the required photo ID, and additionally to provide for complimentary photo ID cards to be issued to any voter who requests one from the Department of Motor Vehicles. And House Bill 4389, at the request of the Supreme Court, to promote the safety, well-being, and timely permanency of children and child abuse and neglect, family court, and or juvenile cases. Up for passage in the House tomorrow, Senate Bill 165, to provide that any corrections employee who engages in sexual contact with an inmate is guilty of a felony regardless of consent. An authorized pat-down, strip search, or other security-related task does not constitute sexual contact has been the legislature today. Tomorrow, more about the state's economic development efforts with the chairs of those committees in the House and Senate, Senator Richard Browning and Delegate Doug Scaff. We look forward to hearing from you about our legislative coverage. You can email your comments to feedback at wvpubcast.org or address your letters to the legislature today. West Virginia Public Broadcasting, 600 Capitol Street, Charleston, West Virginia, 25301. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night.